What's up, y'all? It's Todd Kills. I mean, today we're gonna dive within the sound wave of Stern in My Closet. Going straight into this, um, the idea behind it, uh, even in the title, Stern in My Closet, the song came about when I went over to my mom's house to clean out the closet to find stuff to give the Purple Heart. For those that keep a junky closet, I don't anymore, but in my youth I did. You know going in there, you'll find some stuff you forgot about, repressed memories, things of that nature. I had went through a lot in uh, a few years. When I went to clean out this closet, it caused me to face a bunch of things that I tried to bury, not realizing that I tried burying them. I found old pictures, old CDs, old clothes, all of those things which brought memories back that um, until then I did a good job of shutting down. This song is real important to me because this was the song that made me open up as an artist to where it just wasn't about I'm Ty, I rap, here's Ty rapping. It was more about the story. I had a really, really big story to tell, but once I got up, I kind of tried ignoring the hardships that created the person you see before you. The basis of the story was my mother gets sick, uh, I have a child, um, I'm having issues with my crew and music. That falls apart the same time I lose my girlfriend at the time. And all this information came at me probably within the span of 20 days. And because of that, it sent me into a dark place. I eventually came out of that dark place and I didn't want to look back. So I kind of pretended that all of the good times and the bad times that were surrounding those things just didn't exist. I kind of erased about four or five years of my life, pretended it didn't exist and moved on. After the success of my first album, I made sure that on my second one, I wanted to start with some real life and the title of my second album being My Life the Movie. I needed to start where that realization was, which was as I was sitting on my floor, on my mother's floor, staring in my old bedroom closet and forced to face all of these things that I did very well at suppressing. Here comes that time where your mind just gotta let go of everything that your soul holds before you explode. This is stress spoke instead of building to infect hope. I invite y'all into my closet. Let's go. So I came straight to uh, D Brown about this, explaining to him that I needed to be more open, needed to explain what was going on with me, what happened in the time frame where I was like rapping with a group, disappeared, come back, it's just me. And when I explained to him the whole idea and where it came from and what happened, I, I said that I need this to be cinematic. I need this to be a big deal. You know how like music gives you like that feeling of what's happening in the movies? I needed this to be that. So he made it clear that he would put this together and this put us in a place where we said we needed to make sure that this was drawn out bigger than anything that I had done prior. We went into the studio, we made sure that we got us a drummer uh, to actually play. So the drums that you hear on this track is actually being played by a drummer. We just put a little bit of everything in it. Building up with that, as it has this cinematic build, uh, I start off by saying that this is the time where your mind just gotta let go of everything that your soul holds because these are things that I tried to forget that was still deep, buried deep in my soul and stirring in that closet where I found pictures of me and my ex, I found pictures of me and my crew, I found old CDs and flyers and promotions that showed all of these things. I found pictures of me and my mother prior to her getting sick. I found all of these things and it forced me to actually pay attention to this. And that's when I tell people, I'm inviting you into that closet so you can see all of these things I saw that stir up all these emotions. Oh, over the past few years, I've been hurting in pain, going insane, cause those that ain't know my work all done change. That's enough to make your sunny days turn into rain. With no umbrella, that could make your smarts turn into rain. I go straight into um, what happened over the past few years. I've been losing it over all of these things that were happening to me, um, and it's the stigma of, you know, just men, we walk around with the weight of the world on our shoulders, we don't ask for help, we put on a fake smile, pretend it's all good, and everybody just assume it is good. So it's kind of like, check when you're strong, friend. I look strong, I'm always there to help everyone, but when it was my turn for help, I pretend that I didn't need it, no one stepped forward to say, okay, I'm helping you anyway, and I've been losing it. So with all of these things going on, it's enough to make 
my mind that goes from here to there that creates all of these big things that it creates, it made my mind kind of become my worst enemy because even though the situations happened maybe in a split second, my mind kept expounding on them and making it go further and further and further. So me being smart actually hindered me in this case because it made me thinking everything through turn the small situations into larger ones and then my thoughts became deranged around it. People ask me about nice and they know that we ain't speaking Clearly we aren't beefing but we ain't hanging out on the weekends They say the more I hear about Ty kills him unless I hear about car free and I mean I cut them off For a lot of people that knew me early in the music they would know that uh my partner in music uh was a guy by the name of C Nice and they would always see us together. So, of course, when I go from you seeing me with him all the time, I disappear for a year, and then I pop up and it's just me, the question always comes, hey, what's up with Nice? And my response was always pretty short. Um, hey, he's cool, everything's good, da 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 when in reality, I had no idea. I don't know how he's doing, I don't know what he's doing. We aren't speaking. We aren't beefing, uh, because if we were, then something would have happened. But we don't speak, we don't deal, and it's not like it used to be. We're not hanging out on the weekends, it's just, He's existing, I'm existing. So that's me just addressing that. I delve further to where, you know, people come to me and they say, okay, well, what's the word with them? Just because it's expected. You get used to seeing people together, you assume that one could answer for the other. And in reality, we're not talking. So I go back into it to say that we don't speak, it's no beef, but it's much deeper than words on mics. It's not a thing that I can fix with a verse. It's not a thing that he can fix with a verse. It's not, we can put all of this aside and make music. It's much deeper than that. Off, no love is lost, I ain't never leave him. Shit got real in my life, most of it I never spoke on. But he wasn't there, that was clear. Should I go on, never send them texts about my stresses and so on. I just felt we should have been more connected if we was to form like Voltron. I'm asking. This is still me going into dancing around the topic. I never gave like specific details as to what happened. When people ask a question and don't get an answer, they tend to re-ask the question, hoping to get a different answer. So what happens is I explain that we're not speaking. I never sent him a text message about what's happening with me. I never told him what was going on with me, what was happening in my mind in this fight within myself. But I felt like we should have been more connected if we was the form like Voltron for all of the 80s babies you're aware of, Voltron and when they all came together to make something big. So we're we nice. There's no beef, we don't speak, but it's much deeper than words on mics. That's what happens with a hard life. I still question who Whitney was singing to on Play Your Cards Right. Going straight from there, I say um, I question who Whitney was singing to on Play Your Cards Right. Whitney was my ex-girlfriend who was also a singer. We made a song that was supposedly written for me where I jumped on the first verse, the third verse was open, and Nice jumped on the third verse. What happened is me and Whitney didn't work, me and Nice stopped speaking, they started dealing. So it made me look at that song completely different where initially I was thinking it was me and her song talking to each other and he just had a third verse to where now it looks more like their song and I just had the first verse. Rumors followed out disconnect. Most people had heard of it that took the bill we had and murdered it. Not from the rumors, but lack of effort to disturb the shit. Broken relationship goes from temporary to permanent. For anybody that knows, I mean, we know we're in an internet society. Everything moves quickly. Um, every story goes out there to the public. So what happened is when you're in a relationship, especially uh, in a relationship with somebody else in entertainment, you guys' relationship become public knowledge. Just like the relationship that I had with Nice, um, just on some music, some brotherhood stuff, our relationship of me and Whitney also had a thing too, where people just knew we were a couple and we also made music together. So when that departed, when people stopped seeing us together, it started creating the rumors of what's happening, what's going on, what must be happening. Maybe I did something to them, or they did something to me, or they did something to each other, or we decided to disband. So people started making up their own ideas of what was happening. And since nobody stepped forward to say, no, this is what's going on, it murdered everything that we were trying to build years prior. I ain't a perfect person, situation worse than when the love of my life decided to desert me. No call, no text, no breakup sex. Not knowing it's over is what really hurt me. Then I go deeper into 
the relationship, admitting that I'm not a perfect person. So I'm pretty sure if she tells her side of the story, it'll look more like he did, he did, he did where I'm speaking my part to say she did. So I say, um, I'm not a perfect person. But the situation got worse when I looked and was like, okay, who I considered to be the love of my life at that time, deserted me. There was never a breakup. There was never a, it's over. There was never any breakup sex, a call, a text, nothing. It was just pretty much, we're all good. We're in love. Phone stopped ringing. People stopped answering. And that's what killed me not having the closure of knowing what happened. It was, we're all good, then there's nothing. I only bring this up because it still hasn't died, although I've given up. Niggas still asking details like I ain't give enough to answer the stuff. Do you get me? Tired of people asking me about Whitney. She's living a life that shows not to live with me. I just go in and say that, like, even the people that I talked to and told what happened, people were still asking, well, what happened? Things just don't end like that. When in reality, they did. I say people are still asking details like I didn't give enough. I gave all that I had. I didn't have anything else. I say to answer all of this, um, at this point, we're not speaking, we're not dealing. I'm living my life, she's living her life, and chose not to live it with me. Situations get sticky when this heartbreak can separate headache from a heartache for God's sake. So I turned to get a woman's point of view, someone I wasn't related to, someone I wouldn't screw, but ask around the town and they'll say that's debatable. It gets harder to separate the headache from heartache. So the headache is everybody that's running around talking and have their idea of what's happened. That's a headache, that's just the noise. The heartache is losing a close friend, a girlfriend, your group, and worrying about losing your mother all at the same time. When you mix all that up, it becomes very difficult to tell the difference between one versus the other. What happened was I needed, for lack of a better word, felt like I needed therapy. Now, at the time, this is before therapy was cool to go to, I didn't know anybody that went to therapy. I didn't know anybody that even talked about therapy. So what do we do? We find someone to talk to. So I needed a woman's point of view, someone I wasn't related to, someone that wouldn't just take my side, um, and someone that I had no interest in having sex with. So I went to a friend of mine's girlfriend. We had a relationship prior to that, and he was aware that we talked before that and we were cool. So I went to confide in her just to kind of go to her so she can tell me, you did this, you did that, she's wrong for this, you get over it, this is how, da da da. It was a completely unbiased opinion. The issue with that was, as people got wind of me and this friend's relationship, more rumors started to spiral. We had started turning into, they're not just friends. They gotta be doing something. Why are these two talking? And then they're jumping into my friend's head saying, why are you allowing him to keep talking to her? Which makes me follow up with the line saying, um, rumor triangles turn to diamond, where it was initially just me, Nice, and Whitney. We're now adding in my friend and his girlfriend. So, you know, playing off of the triangle, which is pretty simple, the three points, and then the diamonds to where we're adding more points to it. It was a good fresh chick. He say he ain't have a problem with it. Too many people knew that we were cool. That's how we got drama in it. Rumor love triangles turned the diamonds in it. Turned to me being outcasted by the time it finished. Damn. Because of the rumors, it made everyone want to back off. Uh, because it looked like I did something to my friend and partner, my uh, ex-girlfriend and partner. I then went to my good friend and I did him wrong by messing with his girlfriend and it made everybody just look at the situation and back away from me without asking questions. It led to me being outcasted. Even though in this situation, as far as I can see it, I haven't done anything. I've been done wrong, but because I was quiet and the rumors were spiraling out of control, people had their own idea of it and I let other people control my narrative and that caused me to be standing on the outside as if I was the wrong door, even though I didn't do anything. At this point, I'm screaming, fuck everybody. My anger's getting deadly. I be thinking of suicide. I'm broke, mom sick again. Clueless to where my friends have been. Scared to get near my women friends. My man D Brown seen it at that point that uh, it's that bomb I dropped and feeling outcasted was so huge that um, we needed to build on that. Uh, so then you get that breakdown and give you that cinematic feel of, okay, then what happened? It's building up the story. And then I follow up with exactly how I felt when it happened. At this point, I'm screaming, fuck everybody. I'm feeling like I don't have any friends because this happened where my true friends would say, yo, they talking crazy about you. 
what's really going on? How do you feel? What's happening? I say that I'm clueless to where my friends have been because everybody that was in my collective, I looked at as friends. But when this happened, everybody dispersed, my phone stopped ringing. My mother gets sick, people are aware of this, but no one's calling to check in on me. And then I'm afraid at this point to even reach out to any more female friends because it went so bad the last time. Hating the life that I'm living in, feeling like giving in, cause I ain't worth a call to those I once considered friends. Looking on Facebook like everybody acting different, dang. I also touch on like, uh, at this point, I've been through a lot. You know, we're talking about um, shooting, stabbings, robberies seeing dead bodies, things of that nature. But for some reason, none of that hurt like this situation did. Suicide pops up, the way you start thinking that ending it all makes sense because I'm hating the life that I'm in. I'm hating where I'm at in life. I feel like just giving it all up and ending it all because I'm not worth a call to those that um, I consider friends, to the people that I thought these were my brothers, these, these were my sisters. These were people I was tight with, people I made money with, people I made money for, the people I, you know, help propel their careers, don't feel like they need to call and check on me or make sure I'm good. So at this point, feeling like all the walls are caving in on me and quitting just is the best option. Thinking to myself, if I was on my feet, without a question, I'd be giving them everything, heavy pain. Resting on me with the guard for confession, only for him to say, I'm stressing, homie. And of course, if you're ever in that space, this is the part that a lot of people don't talk about. Um, social media is the worst thing for you at those times because what happens is I'm going through all of this stuff and then I jump online and I see that everybody's doing well. All of the mutual friends of the people that I discussed are all acting different, where just a few months prior, a year prior, we were all good. And I was in this loop, in this conversation where we were all partying and popping bottles. And now they're acting different. And I can clearly see it because I can't open up my phone without seeing all of these people that used to play a big role in my life that's now ignoring me, that's no longer helping. And I'm standing on the outside looking, saying that I'm no longer a part of that. And it hurt even more because even with all of this going on, I knew me and my kind hearted nature that if I was on my feet, I'd be giving them everything. I'd be doing everything I can to help them out. They can have whatever they need. You can have the shirt off my back, literally and figuratively, because I've done it. What happens in those moments when you feel like you have nobody to talk to, you turn and you talk to God. I got to a point where I felt like God told me that he had to put me through this. Uh, I, I need to stop stressing, and he had to put me through this. I had to break you down so you could learn the lesson only to be seen by the stressed and lonely. God, in so many words, uh, told me that I had to break you down, you know, so you can learn something that could only be seen from somebody in your situation, uh, which was true. And in the time that we were partying and doing shows and putting together events and making all of this money, I couldn't see the issues that were happening right inside my house. I couldn't see the problems that was happening right around me. Of course, hindsight is twenty twenty. I can look and say, Hey, moved a little funny right here, and this is where it should have ended. Did something right here, we should have stopped it here. I should have cut this right here at the head when it happened. But I ignored all of those things because I was distracted by all of the success everywhere else. So I felt like God was letting me know that we need to strip that away, put you in this position so you can look at things for what they are and see it for what it actually is. I'm back on my shit, back to my gift, back to being pissed, learning to relax this fit, show my skeletons to the world, now I actually get. Once uh, I got that realization from God, um, I realized I can't feel sorry for myself. I can't be down on myself. I mean, the situations are what they are, but life goes on. So I got up and I got back on my shit. I needed to get back to what I was good at, back to what I did. When I have those stressful situations, then learning to control them, learning to say, okay, this pissed me off. Before I go off and fly off the handle, I'ma sit, I'm sit aside, create something, and I'm gonna build off of that pain. And then saying that um, now I actually get like a high from being able to give those confessions, to being able to say what it is and being completely honest with a microphone, more honest with a microphone than I have been with anybody. High from my addiction, I actually started quitting. I relapsed on my gift, Ty kills him, I'm back in this bitch. For everybody that 
knows me, even when we go back to my childhood. For those that know me, music has always been my addiction. Rapping has always been my addiction. Something happened, I rap. Good, bad, or indifferent. And I admit that I relapsed on that. I, I got to a point where I didn't want to feed that addiction anymore because I had so much on me. So I say that I relapsed on my gift. To say that I kind of um, broke down and I messed that up. But then it's also the double play of I relapsed because my addiction was music. I stopped messing with music and I went back to music. I relapsed on that. And then this is where the birth of Ty Kills Him come from. The guy that puts more of his life into the music is, and that's why I say Ty Kills Him, I'm back in this bitch. I'm Ty Kills Him, that is within the sound wave of Stein in my closet. Boom. Wait a minute. I can't leave y'all like that. This story is very important to me and it's a great pivot in my life. Uh, it's the point where I made a big change that made everything work out for me. So although this story and this song may sound dark, when I listen to it, I don't hear any darkness. All I hear is like the light because I know the ending to it. The fact of it is I had good friends that were around me at the time. But since I was so focused on music, I didn't get to spend much time with them. And they were thinking, give me some space so I can work on music. Completely unaware that I was going through these things and I didn't open up and tell them. So I did have good friends that were around that I didn't give this information to. So once I realized that, my relationships with them got better. Um, once I realized that I had been holding this in and by trying to stay secretive and keep my private life private, that I made the situations worse. Not talking allowed the rumors to spread so it made me want to start getting my own narrative out there and tell my story before somebody else fabricates one. So that made me a better artist, that made me a better person, it made me open up more to you guys. And as far as uh, the relationship that I was in, I'm really happy that that happened because it put me in a place that made me feel a certain type of way to say that I will never make the mistake of looking at my companionship to be based on surface values. And that put me in a position to meet the woman I now call my wife. So it's happy in this to it all. In order to paint some pretty pictures, sometimes you gotta use dark colors. Boom. Turn to me being outcasted by the time it finished. Damn. Damn.